master, true to his obligation, answered that those secrets were known to but three in the world, and that without the consent and cooperation of the other two, he neither could nor would divulge them. But in this is Freemasonry's third degree ceremony, when the candidate becomes a master mason. It reenacts the murder of Hiram Abiff, the mythical architect of Solomon's temple. Half a million men in Britain today, including some 22,000 police, have been through this ritual climax. The ruffian aimed a violent blow at the head of our master, but being startled by the firmness of his demeanor, it missed his forehead and only glanced on his right temple, and with such force that it caused him to reel and sink down on his left knee. The mystique and the, the power of a ritual like this can certainly sway some people who would perhaps rather not think for themselves or who would do anything rather than give up that feeling of support and backing and strength that they get from the group. And those are the people who will say, I was following orders. You know, I couldn't betray my mates even though whatever it was was patently wrong. Nowhere is the pressure to stand by your mates stronger than in the police where generations of detectives have used Freemasonry as a cover for corruption. Tonight we reveal the hidden Masonic connections in some of Britain's biggest police corruption scandals and the Scotland Yard network which one Masonic detective branded a firm in a firm. In 1987, Detective Alan Holmes, a Freemason who had joined the craft while serving at Croydon Police Station, faced the ultimate test of his Masonic loyalty. Holmes was not corrupt, but was under great pressure to betray a Masonic colleague. Scotland Yard's anti-corruption squad, CIB2, believed he knew of crooked links between a Masonic detective commander, Mason Kenneth Noy, convicted of receiving part of the £26 million worth of gold stolen in Britain's biggest ever robbery, the 1983 Brinksmack job. Unknown to Holmes, CIB2 arranged for him to be secretly recorded as he gossiped to a fellow detective in his lodge. When Holmes was told he had unknowingly shopped his brother Mason's, he became deeply distressed. One morning, in his back garden, he shot and killed himself. Former Detective Sergeant John Simons worked with Holmes in the 1960s. I knew Tuffy Holmes very well. Um, he was, uh, he was my right-hand man, really, for, for some time. Whenever I was on night duty CID, I always took Taffy along with me as my uh, assistant and companion. He was a strong man, uh, very good man, strong, honest, uh, no fear in him whatsoever. At the time of his death, Taffy Holmes was the master of Manor of Bencham Lodge, which had at least five serving or retired policemen among its members. The conflict between Holmes's loyalty to masonry and the police was too much for him. His fellow masons from Croydon Masonic Hall sent symbolic wreaths to his funeral. One was inscribed, To our brave, wonderful and worshipful master, who chose death rather than dishonor his friends and workmates. Some of his lodge brothers clearly thought that Taffy Holmes, like Hiram Abbott, had died rather than betray Masonic secrets. Our master remained firm and unshaken. When the villain was armed with a heavy maul, struck him a violent blow on the forehead, which laid him lifeless at his feet. Freemasonry and police corruption have been bedfellows for decades. Many allegations involve outsiders using Masonic bonds to persuade policemen to drop prosecutions for offenses like careless driving. Former Inspector Brian Hilliard, now the editor of Police Review, is a non-Mason. He recalls an incident from his own career. The sergeant said to me, I was in a certain place last night, and Mr. Brown, who I believe you're going to prosecute me, approached me and wondered if you have to go forward with the prosecution. And I said, well, you know, it will depend entirely on what the witnesses say. Uh, he was prosecuted, he saw me before court, he says, does this have to, have to happen? I said, it depends on witnesses. He was fined, and as he came out of court, he shook his head very sadly. He said, I don't know how we can do this to one another. Now, I know absolutely that he was a mason and thought I was a mason. Many police who are not in the Brotherhood are concerned about its influence. 
but Masonic policemen see no conflict between the job and the craft. Every police officer, the day he walks into what it, whichever training establishment, takes an oath to her sovereign lady, the Queen, to, to serve her in the office of constable without fear or favour. And that is paramount. Whatever else you do in your life, whatever else you become, whether you're a Boy Scout, a Freemason, or you join the local golf club, it matters not. It is your obligation as a constable that is paramount. One of the dangers and one of the wrong things about Freemasonry in, in the, in the, within the police force is that you have a group of people who have loyalties um, which are stronger and, uh, and um, more important to them uh, than their loyalties uh, 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 to, to the police force and to the public uh, as their oath. But why do so many young policemen become Freemasons? There's certainly a feeling that if you are a Mason, you better your chances of promotion or you better your chances of uh, being selected for in London for the CID. This was exactly the experience of John Simons. Having become a Mason in the Army, he joined the Metropolitan Police in 1960. When he wanted to join the elite CID, he found his Masonry came in very handy. But there was another vital qualification for young police anxious to become detectives. You either had to be corrupt or you had to condone corruption. You were tested in a way, you know. Um, they didn't want to bring into the CID people who were going to be horrified at my corruption and were going to make waves and complain about it or, and whatnot. And you were really tested. You were uh, not only uh, corruption in as much as that you would be prepared to accept money um, or perhaps if you weren't prepared to accept money you, would, you, you wouldn't make a fuss about other people, you would condone it. When Simons joined CID, a dangerous tradition prevailed at Scotland Yard. To keep the lid on serious crime, some senior officers took payoffs from major criminals and let them run the rackets. They gave them licenses. They used them as a sort of police force, in a way, to patrol and control the areas that they operated in. Now, that relationship was itself corrupt, um, but it was also oiled by money, which gave it another degree of corruption. It was a pretty nasty pot. In 1969, the Times newspaper was contacted by a small-time criminal claiming to be fed up with detectives extorting money from him. Reporters tape-recorded his next encounters with detectives, one of whom explained how the criminal could buy immunity to commit crime all over London. And the phrase that he used, that the officer used, was, I'm a member of a little firm within a firm. The implications of that that there was a secret society, uh, a tight-knit group of police officers who dealt amongst themselves and who could guarantee immunity for criminals around the whole of the metropolitan area. That phrase gave a, a depth and a ring to what was to become a major corruption scandal. The officer who talked of the firm in a firm was Freemason John Simons. When the story was published, he was charged with soliciting a 50 pound bribe and suspended. While not denying his part in the corruption of the time, he claims the actual charge was absurd. Faced with what he saw as a fit-up, he sent word to the officers probing the allegations that if jailed, he would expose many other corrupt detectives. The chief investigator was a Freemason, Superintendent Bill Moody, then head of London's obscene publication squad. 